it occurred to me that I might have been pretty arrogant to suggest I'm going to share any slides that are actually worth taking pictures of or tweeting. So, um, but I do want to be able to share some things that we don't talk about uh, very publicly because it begins, I think, to establish a very different picture of what you think a fast-moving consumer goods company like Coca-Cola can do with mobile. It begins with this idea of enabling desire. Uh, if anybody's ever heard me talk, there's a pretty good chance you've heard me say this is the mission, right? To use the phone in one hand to put a Coke in the other. It's that simple. There are clearly more people walking around with mobile phones than there are walking around with the brands of the Coca-Cola company. Everything I'm about to share with you is about how we leverage the assets of the company to use mobile technology to solve pretty substantial, or, or I should say not solve, but take advantage of pretty substantial marketing opportunities. So it, um, it begins, you know, the story of, of the Coke asset, the Coke ecosystem, the things that we have begins um, with this Jacobs Pharmacy, our very first customer 129 years ago um, in Atlanta, uh, progressing today to about 23 million customers where we directly walk in the door. That's not the number of stores that sell Coca-Cola. That number is multitudes larger. But if we count the number of you know, modern trade, mom and pops, small little shops on the side of a dirt road, wherever you can go, we deliver to about um, 23 or so million individuals. Um, the category we are in, non-alcoholic, ready-to-drink beverages, 26 servings of those every day, a lot of them on this table. And if you do a quick scan, you'll see what the opportunity is. Only about one and a half of those are Coke. Take a look at the table you're sitting at. Look at the non-alcoholic, ready-to-drink beverages on that table and look at the number of Cokes on that table and you'll see the size of the prize. Um, but those one and a half servings of those 26 translate to about 1.9 billion servings every day. 1.9 billion servings of Coca-Cola products every day. Um, in a package that is iconic, celebrating its 100th birthday this year uh, with, with perhaps the most elegant and succinct brief ever, right? Recognize it in the dark, recognize it when it's broken, right? So that contour glass bottle is a large percent, about, um, it's probably about half maybe about a billion of that 1.9 billion servings um, come in something that looks pretty close to that contour bottle. Um, 15 million pieces of cold drink equipment, coolers, vendors, refrigerators spread out across the world, more and more of them um, connected, right, with telematics and ability for us to understand um, maybe when the door is opening up, to understand the temperature inside the cooler, where that cooler is, um, an ability for us to you know, add and enable them uh, or enhance their utility in some way. 700,000 associates working for the Coca-Cola company in Africa. We are the largest single employer on the continent of Africa. That's a lot of ambassadors, a lot of people walking around who can influence and interact in the, the communities in which they live. 900 manufacturing facilities around the world bottle Coca-Cola, right? One interesting fact about Coke is that we don't do a lot of importing, right? We don't, we don't put Cokes on container ships and ship them, um, you know, to wherever. We have manufacturing capabilities, presence in the communities that we serve, which creates unique opportunities. 3,500 SKUs of our, our brands marketed around the world. Um, a fleet of trucks that is larger um, than UPS and FedEx combined. We think it's second only to the US military, but we're not sure. It doesn't really matter when you get to numbers that big. There's a lot of rolling stock delivering those 1.9 billion Cokes driven by those 700,000 people in those 900 manufacturing facilities. So we're doing pretty well with what we have, right? We've got examples across the Coke system of leveraging mobile in our consumer marketing. If you're here in the US, My Coke Rewards may be an example. Share a Coke, the drinkable advertising for Coke Zero recently. We have models where um, we've been able to leverage augmented reality in our bottling um, or in, in, our, you know, in those coolers, right? I think this is the world's best use case for augmented reality. Hold up a tablet to a, uh, to a cooler and we'll, we can tell whether that cooler is properly merchandised or not. Right? There's science about how you stack the Cokes versus the Fantas versus the Sprites. We can have a driver, not really trained, just hold up a tablet 
and they'll know how to rearrange things to maximize the revenue that that cooler can produce for our customer. Um, for shopper marketing, lots of research and study there. We understand the importance of dynamic pricing, um, gamification, list making, and we're beginning to introduce um, those types of capabilities um, more and more across all of our programs. Um, but we can do more, right? So what I say is, you know, if, if the analogy or if the, if the visual representation of success in the mobile space is five bars, right? I mean, we're at one, we're at one. Maybe we're at two. I can have this discussion with anybody at Coca-Cola and nobody would say we are at five. But we need to be there, right? Coca-Cola needs to be um, in a position where mobile is an indispensable and irrevocable part of our business, right? The simple, hard truth is, is that if everybody turned off their phones today, we wouldn't sell one less Coke, right? Which is crazy when you have what is the world's most ubiquitous brand and the world's most ubiquitous behavior not working together as well as they could. So let's take a look at what we might want to do, right? We're going to make Coca-Cola this sixth sense. We're going to use a mobile phone in one hand to put a Coke in another by detecting the instant before desire, right? People have heard me say, you know, our mobile strategy was really articulated in the 1920s when Robert Woodruff described the role of the Coca-Cola company as putting our brands within arm's reach of desire. And the only thing different today versus then is that at the end of that arm, between it and desire, is a mobile phone. We just need to choose whether we want it to be a barrier to or an enabler of desire. So in a world of choices, which is what strategies are, we choose to make mobile an enabler of desire. So that involves telling our stories to everyone, right? We've got to get our stories out to people to help them understand the role that our brands play in people's lives. So whether we're doing um, an owned program with an app that helps customers upload offers in Spain to consumers, and right, us brokering relationships between consumers and customers, um, what we might do with Line what, or any, you know, OTT play, um, things that we might do uh, shared with customers in a promotional context. Uh, Greg Stewart is going to talk tomorrow about the role of paid, uh, paid mobile advertising in the overall mix. We have to find a way to leverage all these things. Um, the world around them, connecting our packaging, right? We're not going to be able to, I mean, it's a huge opportunity if we don't find ways to leverage the fact that our packaging is out in the world everywhere. So whether we work with companies like Everything, Nant Mobile is a partner, Blipper, it doesn't really matter at the end of the day. We just know that we've got to find ways to activate that packaging and extend its value. And the world around them, so we talk about these uh, vending machines, you know, maybe some sort of beacon capability, um, some sort of Wi-Fi, near field, power charging, right? We've done programs in Indonesia where we've, you know, our coolers are plugged in, they've got a source of electricity. That's a hard thing to find in some parts of Jakarta. Right? So if we just create a simple capability for teen consumers to walk into a shop that has a Coke refrigerator and charge up their phone, that's a win. Um, and then on every occasion, right? So I have a, a lot of points of view about uh, a, lot of, a lot of things, uh, but one of them is that you know, a screen is not a screen is not a screen. Right? We know for a fact that screens have bias. So your TV screen is not the same as your PC, is not the same as your mobile screen. Uh, and, if, and if that's a complication for you, nor is your, you know, your smart watch, nor is your car, nor is your refrigerator vending machine, right? outdoor signage, or even your thermostat. The world we are all living in needs to figure out how to connect all of these screens so that they do something useful and purposeful to improve the quality of life for people. Otherwise, this internet of things remains an internet of things, right? Until it becomes an internet of people providing value to consumers who can buy your brands and your services, it's not worth connecting any of this stuff, really. Um, by enabling desire in the instant before, we'll talk a little bit about that and then um, while making the world you know, better for it. But it's not those individual things, right? They don't operate in isolation. They really have to work together. So what I want to try to do is just take you through some of the things that we're doing, right? So as I mentioned, we have been able to, oops, let's see, there we go. So when we talk about 
these lofty ambitions, connecting our stories, right, and all the things we might do, um, it may not sound very actionable, right? So what I'm going to do in these next few slides is begin to show the real things that we have done to start bringing those lofty ideals, that marketing rhetoric to life. So we know, and if you're in the room tomorrow, you too will know that mobile advertising sells stuff, right? And it sells it at a disproportionate rate to the level of investment, right? So long as you get things optimized, right now, we are under, under investing in mobile. I'm not gonna go, I'm not gonna steal Greg's thunder, um, but you wanna pay attention, right? We've got some really clear data about the unique and distinct role of mobile in selling Coca-Cola products. And that point about a screen not being a screen, um, I think you'll start seeing that come to life. So this begins to give us the insight that we need to start retooling all the internal systems that spit out a plan. So no matter how intuitive it may feel that mobile is the place to advertise, the reality is none of our planning tools have mobile as an output, right? It continues, you know, the, it continues to tell us how to spend money on TV and outdoor and stuff like that. So we needed this kind of evidence, fact-based information to give us the reasons to go back in, adjust our tools, our planning tools, our parameters and, and fact-based um, things so that we end up getting the mix correct. Uh, when we talk about in proximity to access, you know, the world around them and those vending machines, um, we, we have deployed um, beacons at the world of Coke, right? That was a very safe place for us to start. That was maybe over a year ago, right? Excuse me. Um, because we own that space, we own the app, we own everything about it, we can kind of manage that experience. What you see there on the upper uh, left, I guess, as, as you're looking at it, um, are beacons that we deployed in a customer location. It's the SeaWorld, right? And that's a heat map. This is an example where it wasn't our app. It was actually a Coke SDK. It was our beacon, but an SDK that we inserted into the customer's app. So we could help the customer understand the flow of traffic. So where you see a bright red spot, that's a lot of people hanging out. Maybe there's a potential for a, an experience problem. People are waiting too long for something. So an associate of the theme park can walk over there and kind of redirect to a place where there's green. Shorter line, come back, whatever it might be. We might want to put more coolers there because there's an opportunity to sell more of our brands, more water, tea, juice, coffee, whatever it might be. On the upper uh, left there, or the right there, that's a map of a midtown Atlanta that shows pedestrian traffic concentration. So Atlanta's not really a walking city the way New York is, uh, but there is a part of town um, where there is pedestrian traffic, residential, business. So we have begun to drop beacons out there in the wilds, right? I mean, quote unquote, in the wild. So it's not protected like it was at the World of Coke. It's not shared like it was at SeaWorld. Right? It's kind of out there. And again, we created this ability for merchants in the Midtown Atlanta area to interact with consumers and deliver offers through beacons. And we talked a little bit about the responsive, right? I, so please, please, you know, it's not about responsive design, right? It's, it's, I mean, you can read for yourself, responsive design effectively ignores the context of mobile. When I walk into somebody's office, it's, people think they're going to get hassled, right? You know, Tom, go away. My site is responsive. My mobile site is responsive. Well, that really doesn't get you anywhere, right? Adaptive. I'm trying to get my head around whether or not that begins to solve the problem. Um, I don't like the idea of mobile first, right? Because I think it doesn't really recognize where the world is. I much prefer the thought exercise of mobile only. What happens if there was no desktop in the world? And the only thing we could define or design for was a mobile phone. If you did that and then compared what you do in a mobile only world and compare the experience to your, it would be different. There is no way you would make for a mobile only world the same thing that you make for a desktop, which is kind of where you get in a responsive mobile, um, mobile first mindset. The things we are able to learn, the, the details about how all this stuff works is really, really powerful for Coke and its customers to understand um, how consumers are going to begin using these capabilities. And we talked about that loyalty integration, at least with Android Pay, and you start seeing how all this stuff starts coming together. 
And we talk a little bit about um, doing some good, connecting the emerging billion. So this is primarily an audience of folks in the U.S. There are a few of us who, who, um, who, who think about things outside the U.S. But, you know, there are a billion folks with a phone and no bank account. So all this Android pay, smartphone stuff, doesn't matter to them, it, it, but they still want to buy Cokes, right? So how we enable that? So here's an example of a little kiosk um, that we set up that we can drop into a community anywhere, right? So I think this one is in Rwanda, right? There's no connectivity in Rwanda. There's no, no operator is going to put a tower in the middle of this place with only, you know, 100 people. But we're going to put a box there, right? So we've worked with uh, Ericsson to figure out a way to build what, I don't even know what the right term would be, but sort of a sub-network that creates a connected capability that then operators can buy from Coke and Ericsson to enable connectivity for people living in these really rural areas. And that has implication to a 5G world, and I'll tell you how in a second. Right, so big ambitions. You saw that language connecting our stories to everybody, but the action here is the smock stuff. We've really proven the case. You know, and the world around them, extending the value of packaging, real things that we are doing so that every package always on will be able to begin telling a story. Wherever they may be, turning proximity into access, you've seen some of the real work that we are doing there. On every occasion, I'm gonna get to a true, you know, not even mobile first, I'm gonna call it mobile only world, really just think that way. By enabling desire in the instant before, removing the friction of cash, and then there's real work that we're doing, getting rid of things, right? The future is amazing, right? But it's still the future, right? An interesting stat, our friends from um, Cisco uh, predict 819 megabytes per month for the average 3G connection. What's our fair share of that 819 megabytes? How do I get, if I get 10% of that, right? That's eight meg, that's not a lot, right? In a 4G world, that's two gig. Two gig of bandwidth per consumer on average, right? The only thing you can do with two gigs is about 15 hours of music streaming a month, right? Most teens, that's probably what they would choose to use their data for. How do I insert myself to get some share of that data? What's all, of, we're all competing against each other for some share of that two gigabytes, right? The internet of things versus the internet of people, we talked about that a little bit. Um, I think you see with that, the reason for talking about all those physical assets, the 700,000 people, the 900 facilities, 23 million customers, 15 million pieces of equipment is to connect things to people. Not just things to things, but things to people. And I think if we do that, then we get to five bars, right? Then we get to you know, a Coca-Cola system that is really, really firing, right? And taking full advantage of uh, in the mobile opportunity. So yeah, advertising and the things that we're gonna be talking about today is core to our business, right? But it's a piece of the puzzle. Mm -hmm.